So like so many talks that we're hearing this week, um, I'm going to be talking about some mathematical problems that are inspired by a game. But unlike most of the games that we've been talking about, this is a game that's very, very boring. And that's the game of shoots or ladders. Um, here we go. As many of you are familiar, this is the version that I grew up with. Um, to refresh, refresh your memory about how the game works, there's the, the board with 100 squares. There's a spinner that goes from 1 to 6. You start at a square 0 that's not quite on the board. And you just simply spin the spinner and move forward the number of spaces it tells you to move forward between 1 and 6. The only wrinkle that makes it at all interesting is if you land on the, on the bottom of a ladder, you move your piece up to the top. And if you land at the top of a chute, you slide your way down to the bottom. Um, and the, only, the other catch, I guess, that makes this a mathematically interesting question is you have to land on the final square exactly. You can't overshoot. Um, so right, if you spin high, if you're at 98 and you spin a, th well, I guess there's a shoot there. If you're at 97 and you spin a five, you're stuck and have to give up your turn and go, and go again. So many of us have played this game. A lot of you met my son yesterday or over the last couple of days, and I played a lot of this game with him when he was younger. And the question that any parent playing with their child inevitably asks is, what size spinner could I change this to to make this game get over as quickly as humanly possible? Right? It is a tedious game, and you get to that 97, and you keep spinning a 5, and you go and go. Maybe a more formal mathematical version of this question is just, how does the size of the spinner affect the game? What if instead of spinning from 1 to 6, you spin from 1 to 10, or 1 to 12, or something else? On the one hand, larger spinners will get you up towards the top of the board faster. But on the other hand, it'll make it a lot harder to hit the end, that end square exactly. So there's clearly this tension. And of course, so much interesting mathematics happens when you have two different things pulling you in different directions and trying to figure out how they resolve. Um, this was a question, or variations on this question were, as far as I know, in the literature first considered in a 2011 issue of College Mathematics Journal by several authors. They modeled the game as a Markov process, got into a 101 by 101 matrix, and did all kinds of interesting mathematics there. Um, and then a student and I, so one of my undergraduate students and I, were talking about that paper and re read it. And we actually wrote a follow-up article in, a, in the CMJ that didn't use that method, but used instead combinatorial methods that you'll get a, maybe a little bit of a glimpse of today in this talk. Um, and then I gave a talk on that at the MOVES conference. I think it was the, actually the first MOVES conference um, up at MoMath. And two, uh, Jonathan Needleman and Stephen Lucas asked questions of me in the audience. And we've had turned on and continue, turned that into a paper and continued that work. Um, we, have, we answer a bunch of different questions. The one I'm going to focus on briefly today is let's take that boring game and make it even more boring. So let's remove all of the shoots and ladders. And so we are just spinning, moving up to the top, and landing on that last square exactly. And we wanted to know, what does that do? What does that do to the, uh, you know, what is the, aver the optimal spinner size? So we define a function, e sub ps, to be the average number of moves, the expected number of moves it will take you to, if you spin a spinner of length s on this board of length p, how long will it take you to get up to the top? Um, the first observation you can make is if the spinner is longer than the board, so if you have a spinner from 1 to 110 and a board of length 100, then on any given spin, you have a 1 over s chance of reaching that n square, of getting exactly what you need. And the rest of the time, you won't get the, what you need. So you can actually calculate that e sub ps, the expected number of total moves, well, there's the 1 over s that you win that time. And then the rest of the time, you're, you're in a basically the exact, you've spun once, you've wasted or used up one spin, and you're in exactly the same situation. So you can get this formula for e sub ps in terms of e sub ps, and do the substitution of the algebra back and see that it, you get s. This is something that a lot of you might be familiar with, right? It's the same as the question of how often, if you roll a six-sided die, how many rolls until you expect to get a four, or whatever your favorite number is. For newly trials, is the fancy way of saying it. Um, on the other hand, if the board is longer than the spinner, then you can see that you just get this nice recursive relationship, where the expected number of turns, you take your one spin and move forward, and that's where you get the one plus. And then it's just sort of a, you're on a shorter board. And you could think of this as a shorter board. And with each probability, with 1 over s, it's a board of length p minus 1, p minus 2, et cetera. So we have some initial conditions, and we have a recurrence. And so you can just do these numerical simulations and compute it exactly. 
And you see here what you get if you exactly compute the expected number. Um, I think S, the, the blue one is S equals six, a spinner size of length six as you let the length of the board vary. And the red one is, length, is a spinner of length 10. Um, you might notice this approaches a linear function very quickly. We asked, can we prove that? The answer was, yes, we can. And in fact, you can explicitly get formulas for spinners of length two and three. It's a lot harder to write it down explicitly um, in general, but you can get a very nice approximation. E sub PS is a function of P and S. 30 seconds. Um, so here are some examples. How good are these approximations? Well, you can very quickly see they're very, very, very good. Um, and then you can ask, well, if you have a function, right, we, I fixed the spinner length and let the board size vary, you can do the other. You can fix the length of the board, let the spinner size vary. You can take this, minimize this as a function S in terms of P. In other words, if, the, if you have a square length of 100, and then what is the optimal spinner? It's the square root of 602 thirds minus one, which is 13. Well, actually it's 13.1 and then you can optimize it from there, but thank you.